Hello, YouTube world. Um, I just want to thank you for supporting me as I do these interviews. I want to thank you for the amazing feedback and comments that I have uh, received with the different interviews that you have uh, watched. I'm uh, honored and grateful that these are impacting you in amazing ways. Um, I just had an amazing interview with Dr. Kelly Palfi, the uh, author of Men 2. Um, men to unspoken truths about male sexual abuse, an uncomfortable topic for a lot of people, but it is a much needed discussion to have, um, especially in the world that we live in today. Um, enjoy the interview. Uh, how are you doing today? Thank you, Jared. Thanks for having me on your show. It's an honor. And so I, I'm, I think I'm sure the question that everyone's asking is, um, what inspired you to write this book? Um, it is an intense topic, something that not a lot of people are comfortable talking about. So what was the inspiration? I guess, what was the journey leading up to um, this particular interest? Sure, okay, so prior to becoming a psychologist, I was an RCMP officer for, uh, for you Americans. That's the, basically the equivalent of our FBI. <laughs> and um, a federal, our federal police department. And so I was working in a unit called the Integrated Child Exploitation Unit. And there I was investigating sex crimes committed against children on sort of an international scale. So uh, offenses like um, when a Canadian would travel abroad and exploit it, sexually exploit a child. We got legislation into place in 2004 that said we could prosecute any of those offenders as if they had committed the offenses in Canada. Uh -huh. So our unit was established in response to a plethora of those cases that started coming in. Uh, um, and it was, it was also um, distribution, production, and possession of child pornography as well. So uh, initially we had an uh, investigation that came out of the U.S., um, highlighted that we had, uh, I think it was 350 Canadian offenders. Uh, several of those lived in BC where I was living. So we developed the unit to respond to that. During that time, I was being trained to be a subject matter expert. Um, because um, uh, to be honest, it was, uh, they wanted me to be able to, uh, eight, um, to, be able to uh, rate children's age based on their physical development. So um, I was flown to Ottawa a few times to take some training under a forensic pediatrician, Dr. Sharon Cooper. And at one of those training sessions, we had a guest speaker. His name was Sheldon Kennedy. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him down there. He played for the Chicago Red Wings, Boston Bruins, Calgary Flames. So um, he came, this was in 2004. So he had spoken to the media, but his book wasn't yet released. And I don't believe he... Um, yeah, I think he was in the middle of his charges at the time. I honestly can't remember that part, but he came and talked to us about why he hadn't said anything sooner about his abuse. So he was abused by his coach, Graham James. And yeah, he just talked about why he never said anything for years. Um, he gave reasons like uh, his uh, hockey career was literally lifting his family out of poverty. Um, everybody in his community was so proud of him. He didn't want to break anybody's hearts. He didn't want to wreck his chances of making it to the NHL. He knew he had the skill set and he knew that his coach had the means to get him there. So he uh, chose to remain silent. And uh, it just broke my heart because he talked about, you know, how he turned to alcohol and drugs. And also he mentioned how he, re he really thought that nobody would help him because he said he thought that some of the other parents of his teammates knew or at least should have known, known and did nothing. So that really broke my heart. Plus he talked about um, uh, the fact that he felt like he was living a double life. He said, you know, on one hand, here I am this sexy pro hockey player. And on the other hand, I'm a victim, right? So he, he talked about living this double life. And at the time I was also experiencing significant bullying. I was in the RCMP major crimes unit. So I felt like I was in kind of my version of the big leagues and it was not uncommon for me to go home and ball my eyes out. So I felt like I really got that piece about living a double life. <laughs> so, and I just, I just really became aware of how, I just felt like society had failed him. How like there's no, res at the time, I felt like there was no resources for men. It started to make sense why so many men were probably in prison or involved with, you know, drugs and 
you know, violence, that kind of stuff, you know, because they didn't have proper outlets for support if they'd been abused. So fast forward a few years down the road, I ended up succumbing to PTSD and, and surrendered my career in the RCMP. And I was really, you know, just kind of desperate to find something else to be passionate about. And one of my professors mentioned that he worked at this place called the BC Society for Male Survivors of Sexual Abuse. And it was like a little light on me just got turned on again. I was just like, I was like, I could actually get on board to, you know, create awareness for guys, you know, and for boys and men. And yeah, I just, the more and more I thought about it, it was like, it kind of lifted me out of my depression a little bit. And yeah, so when I pursued my doctorate degree, I made that my focus of my research and then just turned it into a book a couple years ago. Awesome. Yeah. I know it's, uh, I like the play on the title a little bit. Was the title intentional to just kind of catch people's attention or was that always a title that you felt strongly about? Well, I just felt like if like men too, unspoken truths about male sexual abuse, I just thought, you know, with this whole men too, people are going to know right off the bat what I'm talking about, right? I mean, some people, when you see the title, they're like, I don't get it just because of the little asterisks of the N and stuff. But, you know, usually when people sit with it for a minute, they're like, oh, I get it. And you mentioned you had PTSD being in the unit, which I, I mean, I don't think anyone listening blames you for that. It, has there been a program since then to kind of help officers that are in that unit to kind of work through what they're experiencing? Or is it very much of a revolving door as in, okay, you have PTSD, you have to leave, we'll just get someone else to replace them? Well, Jared, um, I honestly haven't kept in touch with too many people from that unit. There was actually a good system in place and my PTSD was not from working in that unit. It was, well, it was from the bullying. Um, I, I know that some people would say I don't meet criteria, but I had some pretty significant events occur on incidents when I may have had my life threatened as well. So even though I don't remember, you know, the gun or whatever, I remember certain other parts of the day that were more upsetting to me and it may not make sense just that, you know, one of the things that we know about PTSD is that if you feel alone and helpless, that can be what causes PTSD, right? So I didn't feel alone and helpless in regards to the gun incident, but in regards to the other things that took place that day, I did, right? So um, yeah, it was sort of a accumulation of uh, several events like that, that where I, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be vague. I'm just not actually allowed to talk about it because I sued them. So I signed a non-disclosure. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, so it wasn't the work in the unit that got me. I used exercise and healthy debriefings and stuff like that. Like, anyway. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll just, I'll leave it at that then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, you know, throughout your book, there's, uh, you, you rely heavily on narrative and stories. Do you find that to be the most effective way to get the message communicated? Um, I guess, what was the thinking behind the stories? I think so. I, thank you for asking that. That's a great question. I really just wanted the men to have a voice, right? Because so much of uh, the problem is that men don't talk about it, so other men don't talk about it, right? So I really wanted, like research shows that if a man or a boy doesn't hear other boys and men talking about a certain situation, they won't talk about it. So I really wanted to sort of um, give the men their voice, right? Their opportunity. And yes, I did think it was the most powerful way to do that as well, because every one of them had such a unique experience that I just really wanted to lay out all the different scenarios, all the different profiles of the dis these different men, like to specifically to highlight, you know, these are not downtown homeless guys that I interviewed, right? I mean, I would presume that a lot of that population might also be victims of sexual abuse, but a lot of them, as you read from my book, like, all of these men were highly successful prison guards, CEOs, um, lawyers. So, yeah, I really wanted to highlight that piece as well, that this happens in our backyard, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, at the beginning of the book, you mentioned how a male could be sexually assaulted, but they don't recognize it as sexual assault. Um, what are some re reasons for that? Yeah, that's very common. Well, there's actually a lot of reasons for that, but uh, one of the big ones uh, would be the grooming process, right? So typically, um, you know, male sexual abuse occurs 
over 90% of the time by someone that the victim knows and cares for, right? So the offender will select his target and then work to create this relationship with them prior to abusing them. So they may be in a relationship with them, with their family for six months, a year, two years, three years, even more before they abuse the victim. Um, you know, there's reports where offenders have admitted to marrying a spouse just to have access to their children when they become of age, right? So pedophiles, um, preferential child molesters, have typically a certain age category that they will like and everything in their world is around setting up um, opportunities for that so they will fill any void they will create relationships with their victims and then so when they do perpetrate the victim often feels that um they were in a relationship almost like a romance right whereas really the perpetrator's entire intention from the very beginning was to offend against them so um, they're confused about the loving feelings that they felt for their offender. Um, even though they're horrified, traumatized, whatever, doing the abuse, they um, recall, you know, having feelings for their offender. Um, if their bodies respond, which they often do, if they wind up with an erection or ejaculation, um, the offender will typically use that as evidence in their mind or, or try to convince the victim that that's evidence of his willingness and participation and stuff. And we just know better than that now. We know that that's not true, that, you know, the body can respond even though the brain and emotions are not willing. And you mentioned how a erection can take place and arousal can take place. Do you feel like there's a miseducation about the human body or do you feel like there's no education when it comes to the human sexuality of how a body responds towards different stimuli? Yeah, there's very little out there and there's a lot of myths to be honest, right? Like, um, you know, I mean, comedic movies all the time um, show, you know, funny clips of a, a boy trying to hide an erection in gym class or something like that, right? But when they're abused, they kind of forget that they can get an erection, even though it's not opportune time, right? So they typically just remember what they've been taught about manhood, which is typically, you know, hopefully that you can control with and when whoever you get an erection, right? But um, that's not always the case, right? If someone is absolutely horrified, terrified, they get an erection, you know? I, I don't remember the, there's a, there's a parable or a nursery rhyme kind of thing from, you know, ancient history, which it's like unknown author, but it talks about when they were hanging these men, like on the hanging from, you know, prosecution, they actually died with erections, right? So they're horrified, they're terrified and they have erections. So um, there's a, as I mentioned in my book, there's a great video by Emily Nagoski that talks about this. So, um, sorry, I can't remember the name of it right now, but if you Google Dr. Emily Nagoski, she has a wonderful video on YouTube that's free for anybody. And it's also mentioned in my book, so. Now, I think, obviously, I want to be careful how I phrase this question. Has there been any backlash from the LGBTQ community about whether someone is, you know, born same-sex attracted versus someone who becomes same-sex attracted because of sexual abuse, because of the erection and the arousal that takes place? Well, I, ha I haven't had any yet, but, you know, my, my thoughts on that would be, let's treat the trauma and see what comes out, right? Like, if you treat the trauma, um, like, I mean, I've had instances, well, even my participants, right? Definitely, yes, confused about their own sexuality after abuse because they had erections, right? And also sometimes they're finding themselves attracted to men. So, um, I mean, my instinct is to say, well, what was your inclination before the abuse, right? So, um, no, I, I haven't had any backlash yet. I mean, I don't think there's any bashing or anything in my book, hopefully. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's all about trauma, right? It's not about... Uh, exclusion of anybody uh i want to go back to the grooming process because i know you know in our society today mentorships becoming a big thing um being able to you know mentor a kid and help them through high school or you know help them through different phases of life mm -hmm. what is, how does a parent or a caretaker know the difference between someone that's grooming for ulterior motives versus someone who actually does have a good heart um someone like a, a you know a church leader or a youth minister or someone from the boys and girls club who just wants to volunteer to help a kid out of a bad situation yeah 
You know, and that is a really tough question, but I would say become familiar with the typical phases of grooming, right? So typically they will befriend the parents or befriend just simply the child, get themselves involved in an organization like that. Everything will seem normal for a while, but then there becomes this period of time where he's isolating him from the crowd, right? Where he's trying to get him alone. Um, you know, oftentimes the first sexual or the first contact, first physical contact is not uh, sexual. So things like if he's, you know, offering to teach him how to subdue people or wrestle people, or, you know, let's play touch football, aggressive sports like that. Um, there might be the next phase might be, let's do it with our shirts off or, um, they might encourage their friends to wrestle with their shirts off and then join in, um, get them used to being touched, right? So, I mean, outside of, I would say outside of, you know, on the ball field where somebody's trying to show you how to hold a baseball bat, there shouldn't be a lot of physical contact between uh, someone with healthy boundaries and a young child, right? Um, so yeah, getting familiar with the process and um, just sort of checking in with your kids too, right? Like, uh, you know, um, several of my participants said, if only I'd have known that this is even an, an issue, right? That if grooming actually even existed, I would have known to say no. So um, I encourage parents to like teach their children about grooming, teach their children that unfortunately not everybody that appears to have good intentions has good intentions um, so that they can, you know, if that ever happens, that they can make their own healthy decisions and tell their parents. Um, but yeah, like, you know, um, a red flag would be, you know, for example, if you've got a coach that's got a real big history of moving around, right? Um, if he's like, if the agency doesn't do criminal record checks, um, if, uh, yeah, I, you know, if you see him, I don't know, just, you know, I, I feel like I can smell it sometimes, you know, like I've been out in public and I remember being at the gym, for example, and just watching the whole thing play out. I was, it was actually at a resort and I saw, you know, the family with this family friend who has just appeared to be there with them. And then the family friend takes the girl to the gym and he's teaching her to work out, but it was excessive touching. Like he was touching her quads and thighs. You know, it, you know, it seemed innocent to maybe the lay public, but you know, there's no reason why he should be laying his hands on her hamstrings and quads just to show her what the, you know, to, to teach her about the muscles. That's, that's grooming, right? Yeah, you mentioned, uh, I'm reading now in the in your book about how to recognize a child being groomed begins to offer a child opportunities that seem too good to be true, plans, yeah. activities, requests yeah. to spend excessive amounts of time, buys the child expensive gifts. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I mean, you mentioned the other one. Invites them over for sleepovers. I never, it's funny, that was a weird one until I saw the TV, until I saw the uh, series um, Leaving Neverland. I think that was the yeah, one yeah. where um I, I what are your thoughts on on that doc documentary loved it thought it was brilliantly done yeah i mean obviously he was never convicted and we'll never know his side of the story but you know i um i felt that those men were being completely honest and genuine and yeah was there anything that they was there any um cues that you saw with the way they said something way they described something that you knew like oh yeah they they're, they're telling the truth um, I think for one thing, like very um, graphic details, you know, and corroborative evidence, you know, corroborative information, right? But, um, you know, I mean, obviously, like I say, he was never charged. So, and, you know, the, there was never a court process, you know, I don't, I don't know if there's any like explicit photos that were ever located or anything like that. So he doesn't obviously have a chance to prove his innocence. But um, yeah, I, uh, you know, I mean, part of it's a gut feeling too, right? Like, I just felt that these guys were being authentic. You know, it is difficult for victims to come forward, right? Like, especially males. So for these two gentlemen to come forward and to be so brave and, um, you know, out themselves as victims, I mean, they're my heroes for doing that. It's awesome. And what are some uh, things that if someone's watching this interview and they have a suspicion that sexual assault or abuse has happened in their life, um, what would be the first step for them that you would suggest? Uh, if they suspect a child has been abused? Like, or, or suspect that they've been abused as a child um, and they're just trying to figure out like, wait, was I assaulted? Was I abused? Um, what would be the first step for them? Like themselves? For themselves. If Right. So, okay. Well, I mean, I do, um, I do lay that out a little bit in the back of my book, like, um, 
just, you know, well, I mean, the age thing, right? Like, were you, were you touched by somebody five years older than you? Different ages in different states. And uh, so, you know, different ages of consent across different states, I'm pretty sure. So, um, uh, but yeah, if, it would be, you know, generally it's a child under the age of 12 being touched in a sexual manner or being forced to touch someone else in a sexual manner. Um, you know, someone who's older. So if it was like two kids similar age, like engaging in play, we don't consider that abuse typically. Um, it's usually a one victim reenacting on another victim um, or reenacting and creating another victim. But um, yeah, so uh, what you asked what to do about this, uh, you know, there's so many agencies, well, a few agencies now anyways, like seek help, talk to somebody about it, right? So um, yeah, it's, uh, if it was unwanted, you know, become familiar with what the definition of abuse, right? So for example, if you're in a tent sleeping and you wake up and somebody's fondling you, there's no consent there on your part, right? Whether or not you, your body responds, you weren't awake. Um, if you're underage, you're not mentally mature enough to consent. Um, yeah, I mean, these are the reasons there's laws in place, right? Because even if a child doesn't say no, he doesn't understand, he or she doesn't understand um, the consequences of that. Typically, the consequences are more known when they reach adolescence, puberty, adulthood, and they come to understand what's happened. So yeah, just basically become familiar with the definition of abuse. And if you um, suspect, go talk to somebody who's trained in it to talk about it. And for the for the women that are watching this interview and let's say they're dating or they're engaged and then they find out that the person they're engaged to has been sexually abused or assaulted, I'm sure there's some confusion and fear and maybe they just have a lot of questions. Um, what are some things that you feel like women need to know um, if they're dating or if they're engaged or married to a man who has been sexually abused or assaulted as a child or a preteen or whatnot? Mm -hmm. Well, basically, like, it happens to boys and men too, right? Like most of them, well, actually all of the men in my book were abused as boys, some of them as little as two years old, right? By One by their mother, one by their father. So it does happen to boys and men is the big thing, right? And that, you know, they're just as much a victim as any female would be and the um the consequences of that are they can be catastrophic it, it can be a lifelong journey to to recover um that it, it's very difficult to talk about sometimes that there can be consequences like childhood ptsd uh, you know become familiar with the trauma response i would say right because you know uh as i discussed in my book there's um oftentimes um, alternate, alternating thoughts and feelings about um, their own um, sense of self-worth, um, fluctuations in their desires sexually. One day they don't wanna be touched, the next day they are insatiable. So just come to understand like attachment issues, trust issues, trauma responses, that kind of thing, so that they can be a support to their partner. Um, don't be afraid to talk about it, right? Uh, yeah, support your partner to get some help. Buy my book, read my book. <laughs> <laughs> of course, everyone will read your book at this point. Um, you mentioned towards the end of your book about the spiritual damage that somebody goes through. Um, I guess, what is your definition of spiritual and what is the damage that you're referring to? Well, just their ability to trust God, right? You know, like I said in the book, right? Like, how could a loving God let this happen, right? So, uh, I mean, I'm Christian, so I define my own faith by Christianity, right? I know there's lots of other faiths out there, but um, I think, yeah, especially if you've been abused by someone in a position of trust in the in the sanctuary, it's particularly damaging, right? It can be, can be very difficult to have a relationship with um, the higher power. And uh, yeah, just this ability to trust, this ability to have freedom to even do that, like it's so many layers. And uh... Are you able to share any success stories about um, just someone who was able to, um, you know, just someone that was on that journey and, you know, they're on toward heading towards healing and um, they're a, they're in a much more encouraging place in life? Sure. Okay. Well, yeah, a few years back, I had a, a client come to me and, um, uh, you know, just was, didn't understand why he wasn't, you know, 
having fulfilling sexual relationships. And when we explored it, he was really just going out and engaging in, you know, um, unmeaningful relationships just to kind of say he did and to appease his friends kind of thing, you know, and, uh, you know, he was feeling, he was feeling confused about that. And, you know, I was able to educate him that, you know, men have a desire for the emotional connection as well. And, you know, and we processed his trauma and some of the secondary traumas that occurred. Um, and yeah, just, he's now happily married. <laughs> so yeah, so that was a huge success story, right? Um, it just, you know, you know, just creating space for guys to come talk about it. I can't tell you how many times I've heard you're the first person I've ever told. So, and just, you just literally see such a weight be lifted off them. Like they'll say, it's like I lost half my body weight just talking about this, you know, so. Is there something, um, when someone does heal, has there been a lot of research to show how the brain heals itself and how the body heals itself when someone does go, when someone does get the help that they need? You know, that's a really good question. I don't even know the answer to that. I'm only basing it on what I see in my office, right? Like physically, you can see the difference in them, right? They, you know, like a lot of times they present as shy or scared or withdrawn or avoidant or whatever. And then you get talking and they start to trust and they start to be more honest and ask more questions and they get a freedom about them that didn't exist before. It's been my experience anyways. There's a different level of energy that you see. For sure. Yeah, different mm -hmm. level of freedom, right? Uh, for the for the church leader um, that is, you know, watching this interview, is there a would you encourage them to have these conversations in a private setting, or if if a church leader wants to have a sermon on this topic, what are mm -hmm. some guidelines? Um, is there any biblical examples that you would encourage them to? um kind of suggest or look at oh wow that's a complicated question i yeah i think we should be talking about um both both sexes of abuse right i think we should you know create programs and stuff i'm actually hoping to partner with somebody to do exactly that a program for the churches so that we can start talking about it a lot more like i'd, I'd like it to be sort of a breakout program that people could sign up for right um yeah i, I you know i i feel for pastors uh you know, because obviously a lot of, like we know offenders uh, purposefully will infiltrate those uh, arenas because they uh, are in a position of trust and do have access to children. So it kind of gives a lot of really great pastors and ministers a bad rap, undeserving. But yeah, I think anytime we can talk about it, it's wonderful. And there are, I mean, there are scriptures that talk about, um, I believe, male abuse. Like I think prior to Noah's Ark, there's a mention of uh, male rape in the Bible prior to the flooding. So to me, that says God was pretty disgusted with what was going on in the world, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, going back a little bit, I should have asked this question earlier. What are some common PTSD responses that somebody would have um, after um, an abuse has taken place or an assault has taken place mm -hmm. that you've seen? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, people can have memory loss. They can be easily triggered. They can be avoidant. Um, by triggered, I mean they can be reminded of their abuse, right? For example, I had one fella say, you know, his abuser had a gray mustache, right, or a gray Fu Manchu. Uh, now, he, when he sees anybody that has similar facial hair, he's just taken right back. It, you know, it kind of, the response is that it feels as if what took place back then is happening right here, right now in the moment. So the emotional response, the physiological response in the body can be very similar. Um, it can be very confusing until they learn to recognize what's going on and um, learn how to manage that. I do want to write a book about that. <laughs> um, but yeah, so basically, you know, learning to, learning to recognize that any of your five senses can cause you to be triggered and what happens in your body when you're triggered. There can be a whole plethora of physiological responses. Learning how to manage that. You know, I teach my clients, um, uh, break apart your symptoms, right? Like, what do you feeling physiologically, what are you noticing you're saying to yourself, um, what emotions are you experiencing, right, and try to use your five senses in a different way to calm yourself, take care of yourself in those moments, take a time out, um, yeah, you can get emotionally flooded and overwhelmed, so 
one of the things that happens is that your amygdala, the, the emotional part of your brain will just be going exploding with overwhelming emotion. And then when that happens, the prefrontal cortex just takes off. It's like, I can't even think straight, right? So your prefrontal cortex is logic, reasoning, rational thought, and that just essentially goes offline. So um, nightmares are another common thing. Remembering, trying to avoid those, those thoughts, those intrusive thoughts, intrusive unwanted thoughts about it continually. <laughs> You, you mentioned memory loss. Has mm -hmm. there been problems with someone being an eyewitness or someone testifying in court when memory loss has occurred? I mean, I don't know how, have you, have you seen it at challenge within the court system whenever um, someone is trying to prosecute someone? You know, I don't have an example of that, but I can tell you like when I was back in my journal duty days, you know, I spoke to a victim of sexual assault who told me that she just had her memories recovered. And basically I know that our first policy at the time was that we don't touch that. We, you know, we don't take statements. We don't, you know, that was back then that was, you know, 25 years ago. But now as a trauma tra trained trauma therapist, I know that that is a legit thing. And that that's a profound, the body's profound response to trauma. Sometimes things are just too overwhelming and we, um, our bodies say, this is too much. You can't handle that. I'm going to make you forget this kind of thing. And unfortunately, reality is that, you know, years and years and years later, when they're finally safe and in a position where they can deal with it, they may happen to get triggered by hearing a story or something takes them back and boom, all their memories come flooding back. So I'm sorry, I can't give you an example. That's a good question. It'd be something worth looking up. <laughs> if there's been like court cases where that's challenged, I'm sure that's the case. Uh, if you had a um, a magic wand and you could just change, you know, the laws or the way the systems run, or um, what what would be one thing that you would change? Would it be um, something to do with, you know, more funding for law enforcement to prevent these things from happening? Would it be a change in the court system? Would it be more funding for mental health services for people that are in this situation? Um, I don't know what your wish list looks like. <laughs> well, I've definitely got two at the top for sure. Um, um, some states still have statute of limitations, right? So, you know, I, I you know, uh, a victim who's been abused, if they don't come forward within five years or something like that, it's too late, right? And that's, that's crazy. I mean, children don't even understand abuse until they're older lots of times, right? Like, you know, I'm working with a gentleman who didn't understand his abuse was abuse until he was in his 40s, right? Uh, he heard he heard of another person being charged with sodomy and he's like oh that's what my dad used to do to me right didn't know it was illegal i mean when you grow up in that environment and your father is telling you this is what you know fathers and sons do and this is healthy and stuff like that i mean he didn't like it but he didn't question it either you know not on that level anyways you know subconsciously he, like i think his body kind of knew it wasn't healthy because he would have physiological responses but yeah, so definitely, um, you know, changing the statute of limitations uh, would be a big thing. And then I absolutely more funding for law enforcement. I mean, just give you an example, Jared, when I was a police lady in the RCMP, we would seize an offender's computer and we would get access to his uh, electronic address book. And it would just be filled with other offenders who he'd been training images with. And we didn't get a chance to investigate those guys because we were overwhelmed, right, with the cases that were in front of us. So there was no very little opportunity to do any proactive work. So, I mean, it would be nice to have like a thousand more police officers targeting this for a year or two. We might get a grip on it. Uh, two follow-up questions. The first was the first thing you mentioned about the statute of limitations. So if somebody was assaulted at the age of 10, that means they have till the age of 15 to prosecute the offender? In some states, there is still statute of limitations, I believe. I, again, haven't been following that kind of stuff, but yes, that's what it means, that if they don't, if the offenses aren't reported within um, X number of years, it's too late. Like it's, you can't do anything about it. And that was the story of uh, Aaron in my book, right? He was approached by the FBI to um, wear a wire and go approach his offender and try to engage him in conversations, try to make him think that he too wanted to be offender so that, because a lot of these offenders are highly narcissistic, right? Like they actually brag a lot about their offenses to their like-minded people like, oh, you know, X number of victims, that kind of thing. So Aaron pretended to be a potential offender to get his, um, 
to get his own perpetrator to brag about his offenses. And he did, he, but it took six different meetings till he got enough information on a more recent, okay, more recent case that they could prosecute it. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, in Canada, we don't have statute of limitations in Canada, but my understanding is in the States, there still are states that have them. And with the funding for law enforcement, is it, is it having more law enforcement trained? Is it better software to track you know the perp the perpetrators online um obviously you know he, you know people can be more valuable to technology but technology is becoming more useful especially with the internet absolutely both honestly i mean we we need more numbers right when i was working in the child exploitation unit there was times when there was just two of us you know in the unit and then four of us and you know i mean they would promise us we're going to give you 20 more bodies but the reality is they didn't have the money for 20 more bodies for us they didn't have the police officers for 20 more members you know and then you get like a mass murder that happens the next week and the public's crying for you know for justice to be served which is which is fair but you know you got all these sort of cases just sitting on your desk that don't get attended to it's very sad <laughs> and um what leads someone to indulge in child pornography is it they were abused and this is their way of acting out or does somebody progressively get there you know um i'm actually just reading a book that might be something you might want to look at if this interests you but i think what's it called it's called oh perpetrators pedophiles rapists and other sex offenders i think it's called by dr ann salter salter and she talks about that. Um, I mean, that's not one of my areas of expertise. I will say that um, most offenders will tell you that they've been a victim themselves, but I wanna make it clear that the reverse is not true, that most victims become offenders. Research shows that less than 9% of boys who have been victimized turn into offenders themselves. So it's not, I mean, there are certain populations where that is a bit different, but you know, in the general population, it's not the case, so. Uh, yeah, I think, did that answer your question? <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. And uh, I know, because I'm, I'm obviously I'm thinking now about preventative measures, you know, how do we prevent this so that law enforcement isn't overwhelmed with the yeah. wave of offenders that come through. Yeah. I know Dr. Jennifer Conzen um, talked mm -hmm. about having this sex talk with first graders. Yeah, um, yeah even before that. Oh, before, before that, okay. Well, I was yeah. teaching them that, teaching them about, you know, this, the idea of boundaries that nobody's supposed to touch your, you know, your private parts, your penis, your vagina, your breast, your bum. Um, and if they do, you have to say no and you have to tell mommy, right? You know, or daddy or whatever, right? Um, just teaching them that, I think the big fear is that we all know the intent behind someone who does something like that, but children don't. So we have to remind parents that fear is learned, you know, teach a child that not everybody who appears to be nice will end up to be nice and that when this happens come tell mommy and daddy you know so uh i think we can have those conversations you know i think start having them at an early age as early as they can comprehend it to be honest like like you saw in my book like several of the participants said if i had known about abuse i could have ended it myself <laughs> so or they would have at least told someone else like uh, one of my um clients said i just didn't have the language for it right like she told her mom i don't like the games we play at daycare but mom's like well just find another game you know and she didn't have any choice she was being gang raped by the by the um uh daycare's teenage boys oh yeah well right. that seems to be a, a deeper issue with the environment um huh and for sure but if she didn't know the language she had good parents if she didn't know to say mom they're touching me and doing these things to me right she like the, their parents never would have let them let her stay at that daycare and they would have done something about it much sooner right as soon as she got to kindergarten and heard the talk by the police safety bear ran home and told her mom that's what he's doing to me oh <laughs> okay now we need to do something about it right but it'd been going on for years by that point I was thinking more of like the daycare staff or the, you know, the, the, you know, facilitator worker is not, you know, looking after the kids. <laughs> yeah, that too. Yeah. Um, have you had an opportunity to go to other countries to uh, talk about this subject? No, not yet. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you got a lot of work ahead of you. <laughs> oh, but I mean, I, 
like I did the one one of the cases I investigated in the RCMP was at a Colombia, Cambodia, and the Philippines, and I have contacts in some of those countries. And I mean, I've been to Thailand and I've seen firsthand what's going on there. You know, not firsthand, but you know, it's not hard to figure out. You got like a 65 year old man and a 12 year old girl or whatever at a at the next table, and they can't speak the same language, right? <laughs> Are uh, some of your clients human traffic victims? I don't know, is that the type of clientele that you would see sometimes? Um, I personally don't have any human trafficking victims myself, but I'm aware of cases and stuff. You know, I'm, I've actually worked with some police officers. I work with a lot of first responders who deal with these kinds of things and are traumatized themselves. So, um, you know, I work with a few police officers that have worked with like the girls and stuff. Well, uh, I look forward to the other books that you will be writing. And it seems like, uh, I think now because of the media making this more of a known subject, so it's, I think more and more people will be more open to talking about it, more open to allowing other people to help people in that area. It seems mm -hmm. like uh, the next couple of years, you got uh, a lot of opportunities ahead of you. Oh, and Jared, you're being part of that right now. You're interviewing me and you know, your, your guests are all going to hear this conversation. So that's awesome. That's the starting point, right? That's the starting point to ending this, to creating awareness. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I just want to help the next generation uh, feel more equipped. Um, I think because of the internet, because of technology, we have the ability to help the next generation. And, uh, as uh, the saying goes, someone is able to sit in the shade of a tree because someone planted that tree years ago. And so hopefully, uh, hopefully your book is a seed that will be planted and uh, maybe uh, you won't see the, the fruits of your labor, but other people will feel the benefits of it. So Absolutely. And you know, I've, I've seen that already. I, I'm working with a couple where um, one of the partners, uh, parent is a reported pedophile and the other partner was not um believing of that and gave the one partner my book to read and he gave it to his spouse and she's like okay i get it so that's yeah and now i feel like their children are far more protected now right so yeah. that's nice that's nice yeah uh people that want to learn more about the subject or are there any resources that you recommend are there any books that you've read that you recommend websites just programs yeah um the men the men sorry the well my website uh men too and um my book there's lots of recommendations in my book sorry my website's men to the movement and there's a website in the united states called one in six that has a lot of great resources there's another one called MaleSurvivor.org. So lots of great books, lots of great videos. Um, if you need a therapist, they can help connect you with a therapist in your area that's trained. Um, yeah, in Canada, there's uh, the Men's Project out in Ottawa. In BC, there's the BC Society for Male Survivors of Sexual Abuse. So lots of great um, websites out there now that can point you in the other direction. And at the back of my book, there's uh, lists of resources and books that I recommend for someone who's been victimized. And uh, what does the next 10 years look like for you as far as your career? Wow. Well, I hope to put out a few more books. I'm right now I'm working on a children's series. So psychoeducational stories that parents can read their children um, to do that, to have those tough conversations, because, you know, we want to be able to teach children about grooming without terrifying them. And um, so I'm partnering with um, a gal who uh, is the, I believe she's a director of a treatment facility out here for um, abused children. So her and I and another gal from Calgary who is um, working in the anti-trafficking um, industry are collaborating on a series of books. And I do want to do eventually, uh, you know, a kind of a manual for treating male survivors. And a course for that, for sure. <laughs> so yeah, and speaking engagements. How difficult is it to write a book? I've never written a book, but I, you know, I, I know it's a very long process. Uh, what, what has been your experience for just writing books in general? Um, it was, it was a long process, but I mean, this one was my dissertation initially, right? So three and a half years working on that. And then two years working on the actual writing from writing to production, I would say this time. Um, one of the hardest parts was just, um, you know, kind of surrendering, um, the content to the editors, like I had really good editors. And um, 
you know, sort of giving up that sort of idea of, oh, I want to say all this and, and listening to them to say, you know what, that's a bit too much. It's going to be overwhelming. That's too wordy or whatever. And sort of taking that advice. And then I kind of struggled with this idea. Well, it's not even my words anymore. And then I kind of settled in and went, actually, yeah, it is my words. It's just a little tighter than what I, the way I'd said it, you know? And so that was, that was a bit of a challenge initially, you know, and then, you know, I mean, I had some problems with uh, editing as far as they lost a bunch of my references and stuff. So I had to go back and make sure that that was all accurate because you don't want to plagiarize or, or, or breach copyright, that kind of thing. So lots of challenges with that. Like, um, I actually wish that I would have maybe take, taken like a six month sabbatical from work and just written because trying to maintain a caseload, full-time caseload and, and work on my write book on my days off was a bit too much, to be honest. So that was one of the challenges, you know, if I if I, you know, if this book does well enough, I'd like to be able to take six months off and just go write my next one. <laughs> Sounds like a good idea. Uh, if anyone has any questions, uh, where's the best place that they can contact you? Um, I have a website or an email address, sorry, men to 2020 unspoken. That's um, the best way to get a hold of me. Um, or my website, men to the movement.com. And so, yeah, those are two. I have a, like, you can sign up for my email list there or my contact information is there. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, uh, I know this is not exactly the most um, comfortable topic for people to read and explore in their free time, but I have no doubt that this interview has positively impacted someone um, either today, next week, next month, 50 years from now, because the internet's not going anywhere anytime soon. So I want to thank you for uh, sharing with us your wisdom and your knowledge. And uh, I look forward to uh, talking to you again. Thank you, Jared. My pleasure.